Hello, and thank you so much for tuning in to today's video. My name is Sarah. If you're new to my channel, welcome. I sporadically upload really random videos running the gamut from art videos like this one where I'll be drawing an abstract drawing and kind of talking about stuff as I do it to videos where I share about crystal healing and spiritual energy and all kinds of things that fascinate me. I can't really say that my channel has a specific theme to it because I'm an eclectic kind of a person. Like there are so many different things that fascinate me. I've had life experiences that I love to share and to try to narrow a channel down to just one topic or one theme or one style of video, I just find it impossible. I've had people kind of extend friendly advice over the years about what I should do or could do in order to grow my channel and really increase the number of subscribers and viewers. And it kind of stresses me out, to be honest, like the thought of deliberately constructing videos or, or planning topics in such a way that will bring more attention to what I do. It gives me a weird sort of an anxiety. And I've been thinking about why that is lately, especially while contemplating breaking my silence and kind of ending my months long streak of not uploading any content at all, except for one video I did a while back announcing a new channel where I only share my craft projects, my handmade junk journal books. And I finally came to a bit of self-realization on the topic of why do I do YouTube videos in the first place? Because in real life, I'm actually kind of an introvert and rather shy when it comes to meeting new people and entering new social situations. And so I don't really fit the, the mold or the expectation for a YouTuber. And so I was wondering like, what is it about YouTube that I do enjoy and why do I have a channel in the first place if I'm not really interested in marketing myself or growing and attracting a lot of viewers. And I finally understood the reason I do this is to share the things that I love with other people who may also love them. So abstract art, which is a passion of mine, and spiritual experience experiences, which for me, um, add color and joy and excitement to life. And some of the experiences I had in what turned out to be a cult, I feel it's important to share those kind of as a warning so that other people who are also, I'd use a word like gullible, but that's a little negative. I'll instead say innocent. Other people who are innocent seekers of spiritual experience like I once was, um, so that they don't fall into the same kind of a trap that I do. And it was kind of liberating to understand why it is that I want to share on YouTube, which is not to get famous, not to be popular, not to have mass appeal, but simply to reach out to the internet world and the larger YouTube community and say, hey, if you also enjoy these weird, random, eclectic things that I enjoy, here's a space for us. <laughs> here's a little community where you can comment and usually have some friendly dialogue returned to you. And of course, veganism, I forgot to mention that. That's another lifelong passion of mine, the rights of animals. 
But anyhow, that's kind of my long drawn out way of saying sorry for taking so long to make a new video for anyone who looks forward to my videos and to kind of explain that I'm not going to make any promises about when the next video will be or what topic I'm going to cover or anything else like that. But the reason I decided to do a video today of all days and not wait any longer or put it off any longer is that last week I made some new items for my Etsy jewelry shop that include the stone called Moldavite. And I've made a lot of videos about Moldavite in the past, talking about spiritual experiences it's triggered and transformations that it has sparked and kind of random thought streams that it's led me to and also things that customers of mine have reported feeling when they wear Moldavite for the first time. Like I said, I enjoy spiritual experiences and that spiritual type of topic. But anyhow, I made these pieces using Moldavite and one of them I didn't set out to make a talisman for star seeds, but when I finished making a specific piece of jewelry, I just knew it's a talisman for people who are on the star seed journey or awakening to the star seed experience. And then I got this pang of anxiety that I used to talk a lot about extraterrestrial and starseed experiences on my channel, and then I abruptly stopped and even deleted those videos when I escaped the cult of a fraud in India, because I kind of felt like if I talk about my mystical experiences, even the personal experiences I had, in my pre-cult life, it may kind of take away from the credibility I have as a whistleblower. And also, for a long time after escaping a cult, and maybe if you've ever really strongly believed something, like would have sworn on your life that what you believed was true, if you've ever believed in something really, really strongly, and then discovered that you were wrong. <laughs> you, you probably understand how it feels to start questioning everything that you hold to be true. And I definitely went through that when I escaped that cult and started questioning my own experiences and wondering, did it really happen? Is it a false memory? Was it a hallucination? Had I seen or read something somewhere that left an imprint on my subconscious mind that later manifested in a dream that I put too much stock into and assumed was true? And as long as there was no concrete definitive yes or no to any of those questions, I didn't want to run the risk of polluting anybody else's mind by sharing my confusion or my hallucination and as such creating in them a desire for a similar experience which may or may not have even been real in the first place. So that's my long-winded convoluted explanation for why I stopped making videos with that kind of content and also why I had deleted my previous videos with that content. But anyway, yeah, I made these talismans last week and just had this strong feeling that one of them had to be called Starseed Awakening Talisman. I'll show you the one. It's this one right here. I'll just leave it on the page as I draw. And so I was thinking, if I'm going to start making these kinds of jewelry pieces again, not even start, I never really stopped making these kinds of jewelry pieces because I do love it. 
whether it's an independent expressive energy that manifests through each stone imbued with the life force beyond our understanding that sparks experiences beyond our explanation or whether it's a placebo that just triggers awesome experiences in those who believe in awesome experiences either way it's what i love you know, I'm a mystic at heart, and I just can't not make things like this and talk about things like this. But anyway, I was kind of wondering and doing that thing that those of us who are magical thinkers tend to do when we're considering taking a step or doing something. I put it out to the universe to give me a sign whether or not I should talk about extraterrestrial experiences and UFO sightings and the starseed phenomenon once again. And I just kind of let it go and decided if I'm meant to reopen this Pandora's box of YouTube discussion, something will tell me and I'll know. You know, one way or another, something will tell me and I'll know. And here is how existence laughed at me. Starting with the answer, yes, that I should reopen this topic. And that is, I went for a walk around a local lake with my mom on Thursday evening after deciding, no, sorry, Friday evening. Thursday, I made the, the jewelry pieces Friday I went for a walk with my mom and I'm so sorry guys I know this is one of those stories that we all hate when somebody's telling us like uh it was Wednesday because I had a tofu stir fry for dinner oh no wait no I had that two nights in a row it was leftovers so you know it could have been Thursday I'm sorry I really try not to tell that kind of story but just for the sake of accuracy I like to make sure I say the right day because later, if my mom ever watches this video, she'll say it wasn't Thursday night, it was Friday night. Because as we were walking, your auntie texted and told me blah, blah, blah. And then I'll, I'll feel obligated to make the little correction. And so anyway, Friday night, I'm walking with my mom around the lake. And we like walking after sunset so that we can watch the pretty colors in the night sky and watch the stars come out. And usually I walk alone, but that night I just felt like I should call my mom and see if she wants to join me for a walk, and she did, so we had fun. And at one point we stopped to just admire the lake and admire the sky, and something drew my attention upwards. You know when you see something at the corner of your eye, so you look up to find out what it is? Well, I, I looked up to see what I thought was a shooting star. And by the time I looked, it was already gone. So I don't know for a fact whether or not I actually saw a meteorite streaking through the sky. But in the place where I thought I had seen a shooting star, a really, really bright light appeared. And at first I thought it was a plane because of how big and bright it was in the night sky. And then I thought it might be a satellite because it was kind of still like a star. It wasn't flashing with the red and blue lights that planes have. So I pointed it out to my mom and said, look at that thing. Do you think that's a plane or do you think it's a satellite? And she said, it's probably the International Space Station because it's brighter than a satellite farther away than a plane, brighter than a star, and it's moving. <laughs> Obviously, that's the, the thing that makes it not a star or a planet. It's moving fast. And so we were looking at it, and then it faded. Like, as it was moving across the sky, it faded and faded. And I told her, like, satellites don't do that. Like, usually when I see a satellite or the space station... 
you'll watch it from one end of the sky to the other. Like once it goes out of your field of vision, you don't see it again, but it doesn't dim. Like its light doesn't slowly fade until it's invisible. And my mom was explaining it saying, well, it may have moved out of the reflection zone. Like maybe the sunlight's not hitting it anymore. And I accepted that answer and said, yeah, you're probably right. But then the freaking thing blinked back into vision way further in the distance on the horizon. And then it grew really bright again. And then it did a few little circles. And then it took a hard turn and started moving. It had been on a southward trajectory. It started moving east even faster than it had been moving before. Then it faded out of vision again. Then it reappeared back again, moving in the direction it had come from, did a few more circles, stopped dead still, and then faded out of sight and became once again invisible. So at that point, my mom, who usually, you know, she's not a skeptic, um, but she does like to first kind of rule out any rational explanation before really saying, okay, that was a fucking UFO, pardon my language. But yeah, at that point, my mom said, okay, that was a UFO. And so I considered it existence or extraterrestrials giving me the sign that I had asked for, should I start talking about extraterrestrial and starseed stuff on my YouTube channel again? There you have it. A sighting and this is the first time I've seen a UFO in at least a year I don't remember the last time I've had a sighting and I'm a regular sky watcher guys like every night before I go to bed I stand at my window and gaze at the sky I love to watch the sunset if I'm up early enough or if I'm still up late enough I like to watch the Sun rise and if I'm ever out walking at night, I love to just stare up into space and imagine what other civilizations are out there and how far away they might be, what kind of life forms may exist there. If the Arcturians can see me, especially this time of year, if you don't know where to find Arcturus in the night sky, you locate the Big Dipper what can I draw on that's not precious? I'll draw it on this cardboard piece. So, pardon my very rough sketch, and I'm sure I won't get the correct number of stars, but just really roughly, you locate the Big Dipper in the sky. I know that's wrong. Sorry, I didn't plan <laughs> to share this little tidbit, but the handle of the Big Dipper points, whoops, that was askew, points directly to the star of Arcturus. So on nights when the Big Dipper is visible, as it is this time of year, I love to just gaze at Arcturus and mentally say hi to the Arcturians, thank them for their involvement in my life. So yeah, I considered a UFO sighting with a witness, like my mom was saying afterwards, that she sometimes sees UFOs when she's out by herself at night, and that it's so much better to see them when you're with somebody else who also sees it, because we have tendencies, not just my mom and me, but we human beings in general, or star seeds in human bodies, or incarnations or whatever you might consider yourself to be all of us if we're in human bodies with human minds we have a tendency to question ourselves and question our perceptions especially if we have skeptics around us where we'll tell them hey i saw this light in the sky and it started doing loops and it took a hard turn and then it faded out of sight and it was bigger than a star smaller than a plane People will typically, most people, I shouldn't say all people, but most people either won't believe us at all if they've never seen anything like it themselves, 
or they'll try to rationalize it and explain it away in a way that gaslights us where even if we know what we saw was not swamp gas or a weather balloon the moment somebody who has quote unquote rational science on their side the moment somebody gives us an alternative to the, the simple fact that it's unknown ufo unidentified the moment somebody tries to identify it in a way that science would accept, even if we know that they're freaking wrong, we'll acquiesce and say, yeah, you're probably right. And then we'll know better than to talk about it again. And it's funny because I know that that's what happens. And yet even for me, that became a thing where I was reluctant to talk about this on my YouTube channel because I know skeptics are out there. I know skeptics watch my videos. I know skeptics love to troll videos like this and call people crazy and warn other people not to listen to them. And quite frankly, guys, I just don't have fight in me anymore. Like, I spoke out against an abusive cult and was then targeted by a militant social media campaign to lie about me and to slander me and to make people think I'm a demon. And for a while it was like, you know what, it's worth it no matter what they say about me, I'm going to keep at this because I believe in it. And then one day I thought, you know what, why? You know, people are going to believe what they want to believe. Whether somebody has debunked it or not, like whether there are whistleblowers like Leah Remini or not, hardcore brainwashed Scientologists like Tom Cruise are still going to frickin' parade around and act like they are saving the world through Scientology because they choose to believe in it. And even though Sarah Edmondson wrote that powerful book called Scarred and a lot of the ex or sorry, ex Nexium community have gone public in documentaries like The Vow, even still there are people brainwashed by Keith Raniere who bankroll his legal defense and think that he's some kind of most intelligent man on the planet kind of bullshit. So it started to make me think it, it's not like I want to back down. It's more like I've done as much as I can. And now it's up to the individual people in that organization to think for their fucking selves and decide whether it's even worth it to follow that fraud who is hiding out in South America or whether they're ready to start thinking for themselves again. Anyway, the tangent I went off on, what I was saying before that, is that I know what it's like to be in an online war, for lack of a better word. Like, I know what it's like to fight for something that I believe in. And at the end of the day, if I'm going to fight about anything, I'd rather it be something really important, like the necessity for everyone to go vegan so that animals are no longer tortured and murdered brutally and senselessly, despite the fact that we've evolved as a species to be able to produce foods that are even healthier for human bodies without any suffering and death. Like, if I'm going to fight for something, that's what I'd rather fight for. Not to argue about whether or not a light in the sky is a UFO, or whether or not I once heard the voice of the Arcturians speaking to me before I knew what they even were. It's kind of like, wouldn't it be amazing if you could go online and talk about your experiences and only other people who have either had similar experiences or believe in such experiences would connect with your content and comment. 
Like, how cool would that be? If just as a society, we decided not to troll each other anymore, just live and let live. Believe and allow others to believe or not believe. So yeah, I, I was reluctant to talk about this because it's not my intention to convince anybody else. I'm gonna move this little guy again. It's not my intention to convince anybody else of anything or or anger anybody else if they don't believe in it. But yeah, when I when I saw that light in the sky with my mom, I decided, yes, this is it. I will talk about extraterrestrials once again and UFO sightings and that kind of fun thing. And then on Sunday, I was over at my grandmom's house for afternoon tea, which is another family ritual of ours. And she had a book that my granddad had worked on when he was alive. It's one of those books that you can buy for your relatives that asks them like 250 questions about their lives. Like what's a fun childhood memory that you want to share with your kids and your grandkids, that kind of a book. And so he didn't answer all of the questions. It was pretty funny. I, I felt like he was there with us because some of them he wrote, that's a stupid question. <laughs> and that was his only answer to it. Um, some of them he was really sarcastic, like, one of them said, have you ever ridden on a motorcycle? And he wrote, no, have you ever had your head examined? And then he crossed that out and wrote, as a matter of fact, yes, I have. And I joined a group of interesting men, men and women, who ride around and terrorize communities. We call ourselves the Hells Angels. And... It's cute to see his little sarcastic jabs where you could tell, like, he's, he's filling out these questions. I don't know which of my aunties or uncles gave him that book, but you can tell that he's, like, grudgingly answering these questions. <laughs> like, um, filling them in, but also thinking it's retarded to fill them in. I'm sorry, I, I think that word has been cancelled, but I was a child of the 90s, so you have to forgive my being out of touch with the day when it comes to what words are and are not acceptable. I don't mean to offend those who are mentally challenged. Um, but yeah, you could tell, like, he's filling it in, but he's also thinking it's, what's a politically correct word? It's ridiculous. You can tell he thinks it's a little ridiculous, the questions. But there was one question in particular that asked, do you believe in life on other planets? And have you ever seen a UFO? And this is where I'm saying existence gave me a curveball because I have this amazing UFO sighting with my mom on Friday night. And then on Saturday afternoon, I'm reading through these answers my granddad has written in a book to pass down his wisdom to his grandchildren. And he writes, anything is possible, but that no, he has never seen a UFO. And then in brackets, he writes, nor do I believe that anyone else ever has. And it's like, okay, so I've got my mom who witnesses the thing with me. And then my granddad communicating from beyond the veil that he doesn't believe in that stuff. And what I take that to be, when you ask the universe for a sign and you get one sign pointing to a yes and another sign pointing to a no, it's like existence giving you that sarcastic little smile and saying, you have to decide for yourself. You can't let anybody else even existence, like air quotes, quote unquote, like existence, decide for you. Like if you want to talk about this subject, you will find signs pointing to, yes, talk about it. And if you don't want to talk about it, you will find signs pointing to, no, don't talk about it. And if you give 
all signs equal importance, you're never going to get an answer because there will always be some that say yes and some that say no. And it's kind of like you have to grow up past asking for signs telling you what to do. Because your life is your choice and what you do is up to you. Are you here to please your mom? Are you here to please your grandfather? Or are you here to please yourself? So what do I want to do? I want to talk about extraterrestrials and UFOs and spiritual experiences. Darn it. And so I'm going to do that. And similarly to you, I also got onto this train of thought because I was answering long overdue, answering a beautiful letter that one of my pen pals sent me. Hi, Jacqueline, if you're watching this. Um, and she had mentioned thinking about expanding her YouTube channel and talking about mystical experiences and spiritual things, but had some hesitations about how that may or may not be received and what people would think of it. I won't go into any more detail because I didn't ask whether or not I can talk about this in the video, so I'm sorry if I've um, betrayed confidentiality here. But reading what she had written about that gave me pause to consider how much she and I are living a parallel experience right now, how I'm similarly stuck in that limbo space of whether to talk about these things because I like to talk about them or whether to censor myself and just talk about cult exposure because that's quote unquote important or just share my crafts because that's as I feel safe. And I caught myself telling her that if she speaks in such a way that it's not preachy to anybody else about you have to believe this because I believe it, and I know she's not that type anyway, so she definitely wouldn't be preachy, um, and it, in such a way that leaves things open for interpretation, like, okay, this is my experience, but take from it what you will, then nobody could question her integrity, you know? It, it's not like starting a cult or spreading misinformation online. It's just kind of sharing what you do, sharing your meditations or sharing your beliefs or sharing your personal experiences in life. And then I was laughing at myself thinking, okay, take your own advice. Like, you can also share in such a way that it's not preaching or neither preaching nor pandering. Like, I don't want to tell anybody else what to believe. And I also don't want to speak on topics just for the sake of entertainment. Like, I'd like there to be some substance, not just style. So anyhow, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Three cosmic answers to my question. The sighting I had with my mom, that old journal, kind of a book of my granddad, and then my own advice to a friend that I feel kind of applies to all of us. Like you might also be thinking of doing something in your own life, but you're holding yourself back because you're not quite sure how others are going to perceive you if you do it. So maybe this can kind of be helpful to you too, to just decide for yourself, do you want to talk about it? So yeah, I came to the conclusion, it doesn't really matter whether or not anybody else believes in this, and it doesn't really matter whether or not skeptics start trolling me and saying this is bullshit, let them. It doesn't really matter. Because those who believe are going to believe, not even believe, those who have experienced it themselves 
should have the right to enjoy their experiences without the gaslighting of others telling them, no, you couldn't have possibly experienced that because I don't believe in it. Or conventional thinking doesn't approve of it. So yeah, the star seed talismans that I've made, why did I feel how did this little guy inspire this whole video topic? The materials I used for them are sodalite shaped like a star, a tiny little piece of moldavite in the center there, and a piece of a stone, well, a sphere of a, a gem called Numite. I'm trying to twist it around. I'm not trying to be like a home shopping channel person and pardon my old nail polish. Usually I do my nails the night before a video, but this one's kind of a spontaneous decision, so they're not quite perfect. But yeah, Numite, I'm twisting it around to show you how the little striations in it catch the light and really glow. There's a good live one. And the reason I felt like that talisman of all talismans is for starseed awakening is that sodalite is a stone that resonates really powerfully with the third eye. And that's our inner center of wisdom, insight, telepathy, intuition, clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience, claircognizance, all those good clairs. And wearing that wearing, you know, any gem that helps us with the third eye helps us to stay strong in our experiences and beliefs and not put so much stock into what everybody else says. And the fact that it's shaped like a star just adds a little something special to it, I think. And then Moldavite those of you who have seen my other videos about Moldavite, you know how I feel about that beautiful intergalactic gift that landed on our planet 15 million years ago. Moldavite, Robert Simmons calls it the starborn stone of transformation. And anecdotal evidence would suggest that those who start meditating with Moldavite or wearing Moldavite have a sort of a purge in their lives of anything no longer serving them. The old paradigms start to slip away, making room for a new reality in their place. Whether that be losing a job at a toxic work environment in order to be able to start fresh somewhere more harmonious, or whether it be losing a relationship with a dysfunctional partner or an abusive partner in order to rediscover your true self or make room for somebody with whom you resonate. Or whether that be maybe losing a physical item that you've become overly attached to in order to understand the fleeting nature of material possessions in order to connect with a higher understanding of existence. Like, it's different for everybody. Don't fall for the hype when people say Moldavite is dangerous and don't get it because Whatever it takes away, it's always for a purpose. It's always to create a clean slate. It doesn't erase the chalkboard of your life because it wants to take away all the work that you've done. It erases the chalkboard of your life to tell you it's time to start something new. It's time to write down and solve a new equation, write a new story, redefine yourself.
And a lot of the experts say that people who start working with Moldavite who have a fear of the unknown. Here's the other side of that point. Those who have a tremendous fear of the unknown, who have an attachment to the materiality of their current existence, for them, getting Moldavite can feel triggering and overwhelming. Uh, those who have suffered an intense trauma in life will sometimes feel that wearing Moldavite or putting it under their pillow triggers flashbacks and PTSD episodes where they keep reliving that trauma. And people who maybe don't feel ready to drop their day job and start doing what they love, if they lose their job, it feels like some kind of violence has been committed against their status quo, like they don't want that to happen. If you feel that you might be like that, where you don't want your traumas to resurface yet, like I know we have to deal with stuff eventually, but if you feel like you don't want that to happen yet, then maybe it's not time to get Moldavite. But for those of us who are star seeds, who feel like prior to this lifetime, our past corporeal embodiment has taken place on a civilization somewhere unknown to the current earthly way of thought, where there's more harmony, where instead of killing and eating other creatures, or other life forms, the information sustains us, the understandings, the beauty of the cosmos, maybe some other type of energy entirely. For those of us who feel home is not necessarily down here, but out there, instead of Moldavite having a jarring effect on our consciousness, making us feel jittery and uneasy and stressed out and anxious with flashbacks to bad things, what Moldavite tends to do is soothe us and remind us that we can create home even here, even where we are, that if our preferred means of communication is not argument but harmony, and we're stuck down here in a civilization where everyone wants to be the loudest voice in the room and believes that their opinion should be everyone's opinion and shut the fuck up and listen to me when, when that's like the preferred means of communication. When we get Moldavite, it gives us that sense of anything is possible where we can create harmony even despite the lack of harmony where we are. It's a little piece of home to a star seed. And that's not to say that it doesn't also help us overcome our traumas by processing them and putting them into perspective and physically releasing any tension that we might be carrying from them because it still does that. But because there's less resistance to its frequency, there's also less difficulty in that process. And so I feel like everyone who identifies as a starseed who has had some kind of awakening experience where they feel like they connect with that other realm should have a piece of Moldavite because It's like a postcard or a souvenir or a little soil sample from the place that feels most like home. So yeah, Moldavite. In any starseed talisman, I think it's like the one essential ingredient. And then Numite, that adds something new to the equation. Like, Numite is a stone I've only just recently discovered. And it's one of the oldest 
stones on the planet. Geologists have dated it to like 3 billion years old. That's this one here. And conventional science tells us our Earth formed 4 billion years ago. So this little guy has been around for three quarters of this planet's existence. Like that is extremely ancient. And crystal healers have linked it to distant, far, far distant civilizations on this planet. Recommend it to people who want to do shamanic healing on an ancestral level. For example, we all understand scientifically how genetics works. The likelihood of having brown hair and brown eyes if one of your two parents has brown hair and brown eyes. The tendency towards a lean athletic build or a more voluptuous build based on what your parents were like physically. Like we all know that we inherit physical attributes race, like ethnic background, like we know that our ancestral lineage predetermines certain aspects of how we look and our predisposition towards immunity or disease, like that tends to be passed down. Maybe not immunity, that's the wrong word for it. Health or disease, like heart conditions usually run in a family. But in spiritual circles, there's also an understanding that emotional traits and emotional scars and major traumas can be passed down. And I think like the, the way I would explain it scientifically, they've done research on survivors of Chernobyl and survivors of areas hit by nuclear bombs that the DNA of people who are exposed to that radiation gets permanently changed. It doesn't just make you sick while you're exposed and then goes away and you're better. Like it changes the structure of the DNA. And if those people who have been exposed to that radiation have kids, the children also have that deformation or that change in their DNA. And so what hasn't really been researched scientifically, but what has been explained by medicine men and shamans and healers and energy workers around the world is that major traumas will also affect future generations. Psychologically speaking, people who have been traumatized will behave differently towards their children as they raise their children. And that can create a vicious cycle where those children grow up and treat their children differently according to how their parents had treated them. And so in a measurable, quantifiable, psychologically accepted sort of a way, the ancestral traumas can be passed down from generation to generation based on the style of parenting predominant in those who have suffered a trauma. But it gets really mystical when people deliberately and consciously break the cycles of abuse deliberately choose not to do what their parents did to them in order that their kids might have a better chance and yet still on some conscious or subconscious level the trauma gets passed down that's what people call ancestral karma or ancestral trauma and so a stone like Numite that is three billion years old, that has seen the rise and fall of innumerable civilizations and species and eras on the planet. Like it was here before the dinosaurs. 
connecting with a gem that ancient, like just holding it or just looking at something, knowing that it's that old and yet that small or that personal when it's in a talisman you yourself wear, it puts into perspective that existence existed long before any of the pain that you've ever felt or any of the joy that you've ever felt and existence will continue to exist long past the memory of this moment on planet earth ever permeating the minds of any future generations it really helps us put into perspective the vastness and the tininess of who and what we are. And that can catalyze such a profound healing of ancestral trauma. It helps us kind of see into the far reaches of time backwards and forwards and embrace and accept everything. And so for star seeds, especially because we have a tendency to be more sensitive and more empathic, more empathetic. If somebody is suffering around us, we can't just ignore their suffering and go along on our merry way. Like we will stop and either try to ease that suffering if there's anything we can possibly do to help. And if there's nothing we can do to help and we can't ease that suffering, We'll stop for a while and feel like we can't just ignore it and be happy knowing that somebody else is so badly hurt. It throws us. Like it, it came as a shock to me when I was a kid to discover that there are people in this world who are numb to the feelings of others. Like they can see somebody else cry and be like, whatever. I'm not hurt, whatever. Or, you know, see somebody get hurt and, and laugh about it or find out that something that they're doing is causing another pain and not try to rectify that behavior. I think for a lot of star seeds, that's really shocking and that's really disturbing. Wearing something like New Might helps. And this is kind of a weird thing to say. I know I resisted this concept for a long time, but just hear me out on it. It helps us accept the fact that other people just aren't there yet. And it helps us connect with this earth, even though we have sometimes a homesickness to be somewhere else where people are not so rigid and so cold and so heartless. And sometimes there are genetic anomalies, like sometimes really loving, kind, wonderful mothers might have psychopathic children. It's not the mother's fault. And I think similarly, the beautiful, beautiful planet that we're living on, Mother Earth, Gaia, Devi, whatever we call her, it's not her fault that a lot of human beings are total dicks and are poisoning her environment and killing her other creatures and wantonly destroying what she so generously provides. It's not Earth's fault. And so for star seeds to wear something like new might that helps connect with mother earth it does help us feel at home here because we're here by choice and that's another thing that i think is one of those lofty spiritual concepts that atheists don't believe they think everything is just random luck of the cosmic draw either you're born or you're not and if you're not here you're nowhere and after death you disappear you just become ashes or fertilizer, depending on what happens to the body. But I, I tend to ascribe to the spiritual belief that 
The soul is permanent and eternal, and after this life, it will continue to exist maybe somewhere else. But while we're here, choosing to accept where we are and feel at home where we are and maybe try to make this world a better place instead of instead of ascribing to that old saying when in Rome do as the Romans do fuck that like if a time machine appeared in my living room in my living room and sent me back to ancient Rome I'm not gonna freaking sit in the Colosseum and jeer as gladiators kill each other for entertainment or watch a lion tear apart a lamb for sport. Like, uh-uh, if I go to Rome, I'm still gonna be vegan there. I'm still going to be what I am there. And so for star seeds, there's a cool update of that expression in the book ET 101 that says, when in Rome, do as the Arcturians. And I think talismans like this one help with that. So yeah, that, that little piece of jewelry kind of made me feel like today would be a good day to do a draw with me video. And I'm almost to the end of my pile of watercolor papers that I've been drawing on. There's still a couple with blank, blank on the reverse that need to be filled in. But once these are all complete, I'm going to scan them and maybe self-publish another book that can be either a coloring book or just a collection of these line drawings. I wouldn't be offended whatsoever if somebody got these and decided to color them in because that kind of co-creation is really exciting. Or even for something like this that's only partially drawn, if you decide to get that book once I make it, if you decide to just take your own black pen and fill in the blank spaces, that would be pretty cool too. This one here is one of my absolute favorites. I just like the harmony of that design and the delicacy. But yeah, that little talisman inspired this video. I might make a new video sometime soon um, talking about the first experience that I had with the Arcturians that got me interested in the starseed phenomenon in general. Like that was one of my old videos that I made a long time ago and I've had people request a remake it might just be time to do that remake. We'll see. Um, but yeah, I've got other videos planned. And I have this gold paint here because, okay, there was something else I wanted to talk about in this video. And that's that for my second Etsy shop, not the jewelry shop, but the shop where I sell stationary goodies, I've got a new item that I'm working on. And... It's prints of these amazing lithographs. I, I scored big with my last antiquing journey and acquired a few lithograph prints from 1893 that show, one of them is this one here, that shows Buddhist architecture, ritual objects, and art. And I love it so much, I, I can't bring myself to put the original lithograph in a junk journal or bind it in a stationary set. And so I was thinking about what I can do with this print. And I came up with the idea to copy it onto this amazing textured linen paper. I hope the camera is picking this up, but the paper has a, a natural woven grain to it. And again, I hope the camera picks this up, but the Buddha in the top right hand corner of this lithograph has been gilded, like accented with gold. And thank you, Jacqueline. My friend Jacqueline gave me this beautiful set of watercolor paints for my birthday and Christmas last year. And I just had this aha moment that like the way I can make my prints look more authentic to the original lithograph is if I take this 
this gold watercolor paint and just go over the highlighted spots the same way they were highlighted on the original and just add some visual interest and some highlight and some detail and some sparkle. And so that's what I've been working on these last couple of days is printing out. I'm starting with a series of five and they'll be there in my second Etsy shop called Art of Gems Stationery. By the time I, I publish this video, I'll have them available. Yeah, and I, I love, like on the original litho, I can see there's two shades of gold. There's a darker gold and a lighter gold. And so I'm trying to kind of follow the same pattern that they had on the original, like put the gold. It's kind of funny for me to do because it's not abstract, but it's also not photorealistic. It's kind of a, a fun little highlighting process here. But yeah, follow the, the guidelines of the original to kind of boost the beauty of this Buddha statue. So yeah, I wanted to kind of demonstrate how I'm making these. I think they turned out really, really well. And another one of the vintage lithographs that I was able to find. Oh, just look at this ancient paper. Whoops. When I, when I make them ready for my shop, I'm going to try to distress that brand new linen paper in a way that mimics the staining. See how the edges are darker? A lot of people don't like it when an antique piece of paper shows wear and tear, shows, shows the stains where it's been touched, shows the darkening on the edges, but personally, I love that. So yeah, another lithograph is this one here and it shows ornaments that were used by bookmakers and illustrators back in the era when books were not mass produced, but when books were a work of art. Like even these, the lithographs, they weren't just printed out from giant photocopiers. Like people had to prepare plates where each layer of color was separately raised on the surface of that paint, of that plate and then roll the different colors of ink and then line up the edges of the paper perfectly each time so that the layers wouldn't mess each other up, like so that they would be overlaid. Just look at how precise this is. And there's like one, two, three, four, five different colors in this little filial. And each layer, oh, six, there's also that little gray part. Nothing is off by even like a, a fraction of a millimeter. Like, look at this work here. Oh, I just love it. I actually took a lithography class when I was at the Emily Carr University of Art. And I'm telling you, this is difficult to do. Like, it takes a steady hand, a steady eye, a commitment to precision. It, it's meticulous doing this kind of work. But anyhow, yeah, I, I picked this one up and I loved it because I just love these little detailed elements. And my idea was that I can scan it and then copy it and then cut out each individual little form and design some stationery based on it. Like for example, this this corner panel, I'm thinking I can scan it and then copy it onto writing paper so that this accentuates each corner. And then using like Photoshop or something like flip it horizontally, flip it vertically so that all four corners have one that's identical. Um, maybe this one, scan it, and then make a whole strip of it that can be cut out and used kind of like a washi tape for ornament. But it wasn't until I actually scanned and copied one out, because I'm also going to boost some of these with some gold paint to mimic the gilding that's done on the original here. Like you can see that little bit is shiny. This little green bit is shiny. 
it wasn't until I actually copied one out to start painting gold when I sat down to look at where the original lithography printers have gilded it that I noticed this curious little space right here that has hearts and kind of a castle motif and a swastika. And that sent my mind on a journey back in time to my art school days, not only because it's a lithograph and I took lithography in second year, but also because in my first year at the Emily Carr University of Art, I discovered in the school library a book by an artist and researcher called Man Woman. Um, he was an eccentric, he was an incredible thinker. I don't know how else to describe him. His mind worked in a way that most of our, our minds do not. He wrote and curated a book that he called The Gentle Swastika. And on the cover of that book, there was a beautiful image of a swastika filled with doves. And we typically think of doves as a bird of peace or a symbol of peace, especially because of the Christian iconography. And this just reminded me of that book by Man Woman because it's a swastika surrounded by hearts, like a symbol of love. And I, I started to think about a project that I did I'll gild this as I talk, that way I'm doing something useful with my time. It made me think of a project I did in first year that was kind of inspired by Man Woman's book, The Gentle Swastika. Um, I don't even remember what the name of the class was. I think it was Communications or something. It was a class that we had to take in first year at Emily Carr that it wasn't exactly a studio class. It wasn't like painting or printmaking or sculpture, um, but it wasn't a graphic design class either. It was something more to do with the conceptualization of art, like coming up with unique ideas and learning how to communicate your ideas to a viewer or to an art patron. If I still had my old course catalog, I could give you a much better explanation of what it was, but I, I think that kind of explains it. But anyway, in, in that class, one of the assignments was to make something unexpected. Like, we weren't given much of a... Um, we weren't given many guidelines for what the project had to be. We were basically just told make something unexpected. And of course my classmates and I discussed during the lunch break and when we went partying on the weekend, what was meant by unexpected? Like what, what's expected of us? Like what are we expected to do that's unexpected? And we kind of came to a consensus that looks can be deceiving. Like if you look at a piece of art, you might have an idea in your mind of what it means, but sometimes the artist is trying to say something different than what the viewer interprets. And so maybe by unexpected, the piece was meant to be something that looks like it's one thing, but turns out to be another. And so while I was considering different ways to explore that topic, that was around the time that I synchronistically stumbled upon that book by Man Woman. And I'm, I'm telling you guys, like for a nerdy little starseed like me, libraries are my happy place. Especially the Emily Carr Student Library because all the books are art books. Like every book is a book of art made by an artist filled with their art. <laughs> art, art, art. I love it. Um, but yeah, it, it was synchronistically around the time that assignment was given that I discovered this book by Man Woman called The Gentle Swastika and thought, aha, like that's it. That's something unexpected. Like when we see swastikas, we think evil, dictatorship, genocide, 
Holocaust, Nazis, like all kinds of horrific images of war come to mind. Destruction of life, the torture of people, the plight of the, the Jewish people under Hitler's evil empire. And yet in the book I had read by Man Woman, he revealed the uses of swastikas in so many different spiritual traditions. He, he showed ancient pieces of ceremonial masks in Africa that had swastikas on them that the African peoples had drawn and rendered themselves based on their cultural traditions. Um, he showed, of course, the Buddhist use of swastikas. There were Hindu temples, all kinds of different images. And I had collected from the kids market on Granville Island in Vancouver. I bought a whole bunch of Chinese zodiac coins that show all the different animals of the Chinese zodiac going around the edges of the coin. And the center of the coin had a symbol that looked like a spider's web with a swastika in the middle. And so I decided to make a little miniature book as kind of like a vessel to hold one of those coins. And on the cover, I painted a little swastika in gold. And using a gold pen, I wrote a title on it called The Forgotten Symbol. And then I filled the pages of the book with images I found of swastikas that were not Nazi. Pardon the sirens. I should have I should have closed my window before filming this, but alas, you hear the street noise. Okay. Okay, I think I can talk again. Um But yeah, I had had a photo I took one day when I was in high school where I went downtown in my hometown and just took pictures of random things as part of a high school art project to explore a form of art I'd never done before. And I chose photography because I had never explored photography before. One of the pictures I took was of a tiled floor in an abandoned building that you could just see through the boards on the window, like there were kind of holes in the boards on the window that I peeked through with some of my friends and we saw the floor was tiled in a mosaic pattern that included swastikas. And the building was from like the 1900s. So early 1900s, pre-Nazi era. So I included that photo I had taken of that floor and I included one of those Chinese coins. And I also used one of the maps that Man Woman had included in his book. I wish I had a copy of this book, guys. Like I, over the years, I've, I've Googled it a few times to try to buy a copy of that book called The Gentle Swastika. And I'm putting this out there. If any of you ever find a copy at a reasonable price, let me know because everywhere I searched, they've they've always been like over a hundred dollars, which to me is just out of my budget. Um, but yeah, he he included a map that he had made of all the places in the world where the swastika has been in use historically and what it represents to them whether it's a symbol of peace, a symbol of hope, in Hinduism, a, a symbol of luck and, and overcoming obstacles. Like you see, um, when I was in Varanasi years ago, I noticed that the doorways to all the homes in ancient Kashi, like the oldest part of the city, the doorways to the homes had swastikas hanging over them and some of them had swastikas with Ganesha, the Lord Ganapati. And one of our tour guides told us that that's his symbol. 
So yeah, I included those little things in that little book. And my God, the kids in my class hated it. Like I, I was so proud of myself. I made that, I think that was the first time I've ever actually made a little book from scratch, like cut cardstock to use as a cover, sourced pretty papers to make up the body. Like I went to different art supply shops in Vancouver and found different papers, um, printed out images and scaled them down to be the right size. Like I thought I did such a nice job. And wow, that thing got torn apart in the critique. Not physically. Like they didn't they didn't like destroy my work, tear it apart, but they um voiced their hatred for it. And like this was in 2005 when I was there for my first year. Um and I was a little shocked because I kind of assumed art school students would be interested in history, especially interested in the history of a symbol because art is so heavily reliant on symbology to communicate and express the will of the artist to the viewer. I thought for sure other art students would be with me in this reclaiming of an ancient sacred symbol that was hijacked by the Nazis. It wasn't their symbol. Like this little one, what I found really shocking about this piece, it's labeled um, Byzantine Mosaiken. So that would be a mosaic from the Byzantine era. It's angled in a way that we're used to seeing on Nazi uniforms. Like that's not the typical orientation that you would see in Hindu or Buddhist art. Like typically in India, we would see it this way. Kind of like if it were rotating, it would go counterclockwise. And in Buddhism, you'll sometimes see it going this way, rotating clockwise, but angled like that. Typically, we think of that as Nazi, right? So it's interesting that it's labeled as being from the Byzantine Empire, which was so, 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 so far before Hitler stole it. Anyway, yeah, the kids in my class did not think that it would ever be possible to... to see this symbol representing what it originally represented. They, they couldn't accept the symbol divorced from its hijacking. But luckily, like my teacher, who like ancestrally was of Chinese origin, um, I, I was really impressed that he took a stand that differed from the class opinion and said that the book is not what it appears to be, like it's something unexpected, which is exactly what the assignment was supposed to be, and that the research that went into it, showing how the symbol vastly predates Nazism, makes a compelling argument that the cultures who had it first should still be allowed to show it without punishment. Uh, there had been a news item in Vancouver around that same era where a Chinese family who owned a boat that I think it had been docked at the yacht club um, off of Stanley Park they had to repaint their boat because they had painted Buddhist swastikas on it. And somehow or another, like it was illegal to use that symbol on a piece of property exposed to public view, like on the outside of your house or on your car or on your boat. And even though they were not white supremacists, they were not painting a Nazi symbol, 
they still had to change their boat decoration because some people found it offensive. And yeah, it, it was interesting how even back then, the sort of cancel culture was very, very loud. And the, the general agreement among people was that it doesn't matter if Buddhists had it first, it hurts our feelings and therefore it can never be used again. And my, my take on that is kind of like, if we allow the bullies to tell us what we can and can't use, and by the bullies, I mean asshole murderers like Hitler, who didn't come up with an original logo of his own, but instead hijacked a Buddhist, Hindu, ancient, sacred symbol and stuck it on his propaganda. If now all the people who had that symbol first can no longer use it because everyone thinks of it as a sign of evil, then in a way we're letting him win with something. But if instead we take back the power of that symbol and reassign the original meaning to it, then goodness wins then the hope that it once represented and the peace that it symbolizes wins. So anyway, yeah, I, I wanted to share that in this video too. I didn't mean to go on such a long tangent and pontificate about it like that. But anyway, these items that I've printed, and like I said, I'm going to cut around the edges and distress the edges and stain the edges maybe with coffee or maybe with ink or something to kind of make it look ancient again. I'm going to kind of crumple it up and make it look like it's an antique book page. And once I've done that, then I'm, I'm going to put five prints of these Buddhist ones and I'll sign them, even though it's not my original lithograph, but because I have hand painted the gold or hand added the gilding. Um, I'll, maybe I'll number and sign them in pencil and that way you can erase it if you don't want it. But once those are done, I'll put them up in my second Etsy shop, Art of Gems Stationery. And I'll put the link to that in the video description. I also want to show and tell my new favorite book. There's a whole video flipping through this book on my new YouTube channel called Junkless Journals. But I'm just so happy with the way this one turned out. I filled it with so many pretty things, including all these gorgeous embroidered Indian fabric tabs and stuff. Like, I have become obsessed with bookmaking and with luscious fabric collages and with junk journals. Um, so another item I'm going to add to that new shop will be a sample pack of beautiful sequined and embroidered Indian trims so that maybe, you know, if you, if you can't afford to buy a junk journal like this one, like this one that I made, it's probably my favorite so far because I've included some gorgeous little envelopes I've made and papers that I've hand cut and I've made little pockets and decorated them with fabrics and fabric flips like this one these take hours and hours to make like these books with carefully curated pages and expensive paper like this handmade cotty paper from india each sheet of this paper is like three dollars so that might not sound like a lot but when you make a giant book and use a couple pages of that plus a bunch of the lush fabrics boy it adds up in time and in material expense um, but yeah, this book is in my shop. It's $222.22. But I've also decided to include bundles with just the embroidered fabrics so that maybe for, for those who would find a full book like this out of budget, you might still want some of the very beautiful embroidered materials to put in journals maybe you make yourself or you could just use them as bookmarks or make a collage, make your own book cover or something. Um, those will be in my shop too, starting today at a fraction of the cost of a full book. So yeah, please do check that out. 
and I'm going to throw out there a discussion topic for the comments beneath this video. Maybe two discussion topics, one being if you were hypothetically in that art class that I was in oh, forever ago when I was young, and you were also given that assignment to make something unexpected, what would you make? What would your art project be? What would you show that means something different from what at first glance people would assume that it means? And I'm, I'm really interested, I'm curious to know because in my class of I think 20 students, no two projects were alike. We all did completely different things. So I'm curious to know uh, those of you who watched the video all the way to the end like this, you're, you're my best friends, you're, you're my people, you're the people like me who put on a podcast and listen to the whole darn thing. Um, I love to do that too, by the way. Yeah, what would you make? And second, what do you think of swastikas? Should they be forever banned from the world of iconography and symbology because the Nazis used them? Or should they be brought back to life, reintroduced in a culturally, what's the word I'm looking for? Hmm. In their original form, for in a, in a way that symbolizes what they were originally meant to symbolize. Should they fade from existence and never resurface? Or, or do you think Man woman was onto something when he set it as his her life goal to bring back this beautiful ancient symbol. Anyway, I look forward to reading your comments. Thank you so much for watching. I'm not going to promise to make another video soon because who knows when the inspiration will strike, but I hope you will be there with me when I do. So much love to you for now and for always. Hopefully see you soon in another video. If not, chat with you soon in the comment section. Bye!